people here at Perimeter for hosting me. I'll be, I'll be occasionally coming back here, and uh, I'm always had a uh, very fun time here. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, electroweak quintessence action, uh, which is a, is a different topic from other things I have been working on. And I was just worried that maybe this talk might be for the wrong audience. <laughs> and, uh, but this is supposed to be uh, partly joint with cosmology, so um, that uh, it's, uh, it's organized that way. So uh, some people might find it too elementary, some people might find it incomprehensible. So it might depend on the background, but uh, let, let me try uh, what I'm going to say. So, uh, okay, so what are we going to talk about? Well, what I'm going to talk about is about a swamp round, and I heard that uh, there are talks by, uh, there's a talk by a colloquium, I think, by Cameron about the swamp round. Uh, so people might heard about it, uh, but let me try to give you a, a sort of an idea of what swamp round is, and why it can be interesting as a very, uh, and uh, as a very uh, elementary introduction. And uh, so what we are going to do uh, as a physicist is that you're going to be some interesting uh, results, like observations, et cetera. And uh, we're trying to explain it. And if you are, for example, a uh, quantum field series, then the means to come up with some e effective quantum field theory to describe it. Uh, but of course, uh, and sometimes it works very well, but in other cases, there is a huge possibility. So there are possible, huge possibility of effective field theories, and it's not clear uh, fit theory to think about. And this is a very important problem, for example, uh, in thinking about the beyond the standard model physics and LSC, and uh, there is the issue of naturalness, et cetera. So the people have certainly thought about uh, large possibilities of what, how, what can be described by dark matter and everything. So there are a lot of possibilities. And, and the swamp round idea is that perhaps uh, you can cut down some possibilities by consulting the quantum gravity. So what is exactly does it meant by um, consulting quantum gravity? Well, so what it means is that at least, first of all, if you start with a quantum gravity, such as string theory, Whatever that is, it will generate, uh, as an end result, some low energy effective quantum field theory. Um, so that's certainly people have been doing for a long time. And, uh, and in practice, that means to specify some setup. For example, you can take a heterotic compactation on Calabria 3, and, uh, and then there are various choices of Calabria 3, and then it gives rise to a certain number of matter content, et cetera. And that's certainly not a unique possibility. There are other possibilities related by dualities. Uh, so what people typically meant uh, in the string phenomenology for a long time is that uh, let's take this theory and try to work out the consequences in this setup. So that's an important uh, uh, in, uh, 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 work uh, in, in, in the exploration of string theory and quantum gravity, but it's also the case that whatever results you derive in some particular compactation, that might not be completely general. So you find that there are certain results that hold true, but it can be that they might not hold if you consider other compactation of string theory, for example. And the swamp round paradigm these days is to try to uh, approach the problem from really a different angle, different direction. And instead of talking about specific constructions, uh, the idea is that, okay, so this is a given effective field theory, and let's impose the condition that it has some UV compression. Some UV compression, so there exists UV compression, and you don't necessarily know how, but let's impose the condition that exists. And then that cuts down the possibility already. Uh, and so the non trivial point is that uh, uh, the concept of swamp run, so there is a huge region of, of the possibility of a low energy effect field series, which looks completely consistent with low energy viewpoint, but somehow doesn't arise from uh, quantum gravity. And that's a theory called a swamp run, and that's, uh, that's as opposed to the landscape uh, coming from quantum gravity and string theory. So uh, the, the usual construction begins to explore the possibilities inside quantum gravity. Here we are discussing the impossibilities uh, in, in, the, uh, in quantum gravity series. And of course the big question is, uh, what's the boundary here and how to characterize that? And um, uh, so, well, let's see. So that's a big question and uh, nobody has had the final word on that. And, but it seems to be that uh, the constraint, well, first of all, there the, the seems to be some theories which are actually in the swamp run, they're not in the landscape. And some people even go farther and then you have a sense that maybe strings uh, landscape might be very special inside this parameter space effective field theory. Okay, so I don't mean to mean anything precise here, and, but sometimes, and also if it's a huge parameter space, but it might be that string theory, uh, low energy effective field theory coming from string theory might be actually very, very special. And if this is a case that has important consequences, 
uh, about thinking about fine tuning problems in phenomenology and cosmology. For example, uh, after uh, well, some recent results of BLC, people are talking about the fine, uh, fine tuning problem. And uh, about how, how, for example, you might be stuck in here, and it looks extremely fine tuned in the, inside all the possible effective field theory, but uh, it's, it might not be that fine tuned inside the string theory landscape. So that's the uh, idea uh, of the swamp round, et cetera. So as a general idea, uh, it seems extremely natural and uh, interesting. Well, we accept that, of course, the whole point is that you don't necessarily know what quantum gravity is um, and uh, what are the general consequences, et cetera. So that's uh, the very tricky part of this business. Uh, so people, what people try to do is to formulate some conjectures. Uh, that's the swamp round conjectures. So these are supposed to be necessary but not sufficient conditions for the existence of UV compression. So that's something very concrete, typically you can verify whether it's just satisfied or not. And, and once you have that, uh, and, uh, and uh, once you have that condition, it doesn't guarantee that it comes from some particular string theory, but at least you, it's a minimal check. And if that condition is not satisfied, you conclude that uh, it doesn't belong to the string theory landscape. Well, but of course these are conjectures. And in fact, uh, there is now, now that uh, I think there are uh, 30, many, many, uh, 30, 20 or 30, many uh, sample conjectures in the market, but every one of them is a conjecture. So uh, depending on preference, you might not believe any, any of these, or but some people believe in some of these and, uh, and uh, are not interested in more speculative ones. So that's all up to you. But at least uh, people try to make some educated guesses on what the general property of, of the quantum gravity is, and then try to formulate some conjectures. And you, but still, you need some input. And uh, so the input comes from several different ingredients. Uh, well, let's see, for example, the semi-classical GR. By this, I mean black holes of entropy, Hawking radiates, and, uh, and et cetera. Also, string theory uh, gives us many examples. And so whatever conjecture you have, you can try to hope to check that in various examples. And sometimes there are quantitative and mathematical statements coming out. If you believe in the conjecture, then you can try to check that. And, uh, but it's also the case that sometimes there are important input from uh, observational phenomenological constraints. And that is the aspect somehow I became interested in uh, recently. And uh, my talk is along these lines in a sense. Yes? Specifically by experiments, what kind of experiments you want? Well, let's see, basically any experiment, but uh, for example, the one I'm coming to right now in the next slide is, for example, there is a Higgs, Higgs field in the standard mode, for example. Those sometimes elementary things. But it can be also be, for example, it might be believed that the inflation happens, for example, and then what kind of constraint it can be, depending on the specific inflation model, for example. And well, there are also other constraints if there is a some scalar field in the people, for example, people say that the string theory often predicts the moduli, for example. And then there could be a moduli problem, there are fifth fourth such constraints, and all these are uh, constraints. So, uh, okay, so I'm not necessarily, uh, so as long as there, uh, there is something we can learn from that experiment, I'm happy to take that. Okay, so uh, let's see. So, and then my talk today is about trying to understand dark energy and somewhat along these lines uh, with a little bit of help. Actually, not too much, but a little bit help with some plant conjectures. But perhaps before coming to that, uh, let me just say a word about, uh, a few words about uh, the, the swamp plant conjecture, uh, because uh, this is the topic a lot of people ask me about. And, uh, uh, and probably Kamara also talked about this, and then, the, okay, so what is the conjecture? Uh, well, it says that if you start with the low energy field theory, this is the potential, and the potential should satisfy this inequality, while the left-hand side is the derivative, and the right-hand side is the potential itself, which uh, times all the one constant, and the left hand side is well, it's the size of the derivative, it's always positive. And also there is a huge number of Planck constant there. So it's almost always huge, except that when the derivative is very small, uh, you, ex you might expect some violation of this inequality. And in particular, if you, if you, if you believe in this conjecture, then uh, DS back here is ruled out. DS back here is the point where the first derivative is both zero and the uh, potential is positive. So this is what I mean by DS back here. It can be metastable. Uh, but it, I don't care. And if this is the case, this is, so, so those vacuum are ruled out by this inequality. Okay, this is a very trivial mathematics. But, um, uh, and and uh, uh, so, uh, so Kamara and others propose this conjecture. And uh, well, I would say that it's very speculative. And, uh, and, and uh, afterwards, it, it generated a lot of controversy. And uh, because, partly because it, 
if you believe in this conjecture, it eliminates a lot of stuff like KKLT, large volume scenario, and all these fast, fast vacuum scenarios. And there are a lot of like, discussion ensued. Uh, but it seems that um, so, so far, uh, there seems to be no general, complete general consensus in the community. So while it's interesting to revisit all these issues, I took a lot of different approach, which is that, OK, so fine. OK, so it, it's fine to talk about the ground theory of the string theory and alpha prime correction of string, et cetera. But before talking about that, uh, we should first think about uh, what we thought we know, which is, for example, Higgs field in the standard model. And there is an extremely elementary observation that if you have the Higgs potential, and if you are at the top of this potential, well, and then, well, OK, so it, there is no reason uh, not to be here. So you, it, I'm not necessarily claiming that it happens in the history of the universe. Uh, it can be, but, uh, but in the, you can consider theoretically the possibility that the Higgs field is there, and then the first derivative is zero, and uh, uh, so, and the po potential energy is positive, so this inequality is obviously uh, violated. So that's already, well, you can, you can realize this in after thinking about this two minutes, and, uh, but it seems that this uh, is already in tension with this conjecture. Well, except that uh, there can be still loopholes, so if you want to think seriously, uh, maybe there can be some other modification. For example, it might be that, okay, there is a Higgs field, but there can be unknown Higgs-like field, as in supersonic theory or something like that. There can be other things. And uh, suppose that it's a polynomial. Well, in this case, I, I chose a particular potential with the two, one, one more Higgs field, but it can be anything, and it can be many, many fields, many, many Higgs fields, et cetera. And, uh, and then uh, you might hope that it might solve the problem. It turns out this is, uh, again, elementary uh, uh, mathematics. And uh, at least under some assumptions, even if you take multiple Higgs field and various different potentials, et cetera, there is always a point uh, where this condition is satisfied. Uh, under some assumption. There are some small loopholes, but uh, these are very uh, contrived possibilities. And another thing people thought about is, OK, Higgs potential has a problem, but maybe suppose that uh, there is, exists some another field, quintessence. That's the thing which I'm coming to afterwards. Uh, but somehow it couples to the Higgs field by this combination, exponential. And this is, again, another uh, very simple uh, mathematics to show that, uh, OK, if you have this, such a coupling, there is a non-zero non derivative. Uh, with respect to this Q, so uh, you can save the uh, condition of the first derivative. There is always this Q, is, uh, is always, th there is always a non-zero derivative in the direction of Q, so you can save this potential, for example. So these are some phenomenological loopholes, but interestingly, these possibilities are also uh, extremely hard uh, because of the uh, results uh, on the time dependence on the proton versus the electron. The way how it works is that, okay, there is Higgs potential, there is Higgs web, and, uh, and that's a fixed number, except that if you try to take into account the quantum correction, there is a one loop collection, and then the quintessence dependence uh, does enter into the web of the Higgs. And uh, so it means that uh, uh, this proton electron mass ratio is time being dependent, and that's already in tension with the experiment. Uh, uh, if this coefficient c is all of one, that's what is. Uh, uh, so, okay, so this is a small example, and, uh, uh, of, and then, we, uh, but, uh, but the point is that uh, it's fine to have the uh, interesting conjectures about the quantum gravity in general, uh, but uh, there are some interest, sometimes there are some interesting constraints coming from, in this case, the Higgs in particular. And that was helpful to, uh, uh, to make, this, uh, make this conjecture very unplausible. And, and subsequently, people tried to uh, revise the conjecture in various different ways. So people went to redefine the DS conjecture, et cetera. And, the, and of course, then, if you weaken it, it becomes harder to constrain this way. Uh, but they might sometimes have interesting constraints for inflation, et cetera. So that story continues. Uh, but that's uh, one small uh, example. Uh, it's, it might not be the most exciting example, but it's one small example where uh, phenomenological considerations does uh, say something uh, sharp about the conjectures where people in string theory committees uh, kind of have a, uh, don't necessarily have to uh, come to a global agreement. OK, so, so this is the idea of how it works. But uh, now I'm coming to uh, my main topic. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, when I first preparing the talk, I thought maybe I should try to skip through, uh, well, let's skip through all the various different things I've done. And, uh, and this is uh, the, the, the thing I just described I did in my first paper. But then I realized there can be uh, uh, various interesting consequences. And, uh, and, and I came to be interested in this topic, uh, especially at the intersection of uh, uh, like the particle physics and cosmology and, and uh, uh, some brown business. 
And, and I have worked with uh, various different people, many of uh, whom are uh, particle physicists or uh, cosmologists. And uh, for example, uh, he is a postdoc at UCLA, and uh, uh, he he works. Uh, he has many papers in astrophysics, for example. So uh, for me, it's a, it's a fun to uh, think about these ingredients. Um, and uh, uh, but of course, uh, I don't have time to talk about everything. So uh, rather than uh, well speaking too fast and. Uh, uh, I try to be more relaxed. Uh, maybe I'm still speaking too fast or, or maybe too slow, I don't know. But, uh, but rather than doing that, let me try to concentrate on this one particular paper um, uh, in collaboration with Masahiro Ibe and Stomu Yanagida. And, uh, and, and I like a lot of short uh, uh, conference proceedings for that too. And the both are uh, very short, so it's not too hard to read it if you're interested. But anyway, the main points I'm going to say today, anyway. OK, so, uh, so now I'm switching gears and I try to apply the swamp round ideas uh, to, uh, to the consideration of dark energy. And also, dark energy is certainly a very exciting topic and very mysterious. And I happen to notice that that perimeter, there are a lot of uh, dark energy act uh, related uh, talks, even this week. And uh, even right now, actually, I noticed that there is another talk about the dark energy so, and modified gravity. So, uh, so uh, but, but anyway, so it's a very mysterious topic. And one of the things, surprising thing, first of all, uh, is that it's, uh, there is a non-trivial uh, value of the cosmological constant. And well, I came relatively late really to uh, undergrad and graduate school, et cetera. So by the time I came to university, people knew that lambda is positive, more or less. But uh, if you look at the literature, a lot of people, a lot of very clever people wrote that lambda should be zero, for example. And they were wrong. And, and then the way it's settled is that by observations with uh, independent observations. And the data find the extremely impressive. Uh, although but nowadays people take it for granted. And then, of course, uh, there is a fact that the body of the lambda is extremely small. Well, extremely small, measured in units of the Planck scale. If you measure it in the Planck scale, the size of the dark energy, like a midi electron volt, uh, so it's like, a, it, 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 as far as energy is concerned, it's like a 10 to minus 120. And of course, this is a notorious cosmological constant problem. And I should uh, say that I'm not going to solve the cosmological constant problem in full generality today. So uh, that's beyond me. And, uh, but, but still, that's, I think, um, that's still that this is an interesting quantity. And, uh, and the one comment I have is that, okay, if this is a problem, the minimum comment I have is that, okay, first of all, this is an extremely small energy, maybe electron volt. Uh, especially in terms of the particle physics viewpoint. Uh, there is a neutrino mass and it's close to the scale, but any other elemental particles, uh, they have much higher masses other than the like massless photons, et cetera, gravitons. And, uh, and so that's extremely low energy in a sense. But once you formulate this question this way, it's also about uh, UV. So that's extremely high energy Planck scale. So uh, in a sense, this is an interesting interplay between UV and R. And if you try to think about this problem, in a sense, you have to think about UV too, because that's how I formulated the question. At least if you formulate this question that way. Well, some people say that, okay, I don't care about the Planck scale and I should have a, like 100 MeV here, et cetera. I heard of that opinion. But at least if you formulate this question that way, this way, then you have to talk about UV physics at the Planck scale, which is the quantum gravity and string theory. So that's where there could be a room for swamp plant ideas to come in. Um, okay, so, um, uh, but how, exactly how, and, uh, and, and the way it proceeds the forest. First of all, I, I take this dark energy, and, and I like to take the observational results series. The first of lambda is positive, but it generates a particular value of the dark energy. And then there is a conventional low energy effect field theory, and, uh, and, and then I'm going to take an input from quantum gravity. And certainly there are a lot of uh, uh, papers discussing the dark energy from low energy effect field theory framework. And usually they don't care about the quantum gravity because whatever quantum gravity effects are that will generate one particular low energy field theory. But I ordered, uh, okay, I explained already that, uh, so that's what the effective field series might say, but that's actually misleading because not all the low energy field theories come from quantum gravity. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is to try to take into account the constraints of quantum gravity in the form of some prime conditions. So that's not everything about quantum gravity, but it's still useful input. Okay, then, okay, so after this, uh, let's, let's try to come to how to realize the dark energy. Now, in, in quantum series of quantum gravity like string theory, there is no such parameter, free parameter. So 
whatever the value of the zark energy is, that should arise somewhat dynamically. So what this means is that uh, there is some, uh, some scalar field, like a moduli, a string coupling constant, or some moduli, uh, some scalar field, and it has a potential, certain potential, and there is a dynamic process where it equilibrates, so it, it uh, uh, comes to the local minimum, and that, the value of the potential there uh, gives light to the size of the dark energy. And this is the most dominant scenario, and, uh, but it can be other, most, uh, other scenarios. For example, that's the scenario of the quintessence. So in the quintessence scenario, uh, well, okay, there is no, we are not actually at the local minimum, but it's actually still loading. So it's still loading. So the, the value of the dark energy is changing. But of course, if it changes too rapidly, and we will find it easily by observation, so we should find very slowly. So it should be very slow low, but nevertheless, that's a, a one, another possibility. And a lot of people have, so, uh, have the opinion that this is a more natural possibility, and there are good reasons for that. But nevertheless, I'm going to today think about this uh, quintessence scenario. Okay, so why, why I'm going to do that? Well, partly because I was a little bit surprised as in thinking about the swamp run conjectures, et cetera, uh, that there seems to be very few discussions of the quintessence scenario in, in quantum gravity and string theory in, uh, context. There are thousands and thousands of paper in quintessence, but not much uh, taking into account uh, constraints from UV. Um, and also, uh, people know that uh, uh, having the DS back here, the, the other possibility, is somewhat difficult in weak coupling regions of the uh, parameter space, and superficially, it looks easier to get the quintessence. Although, in, in practice, it's not that easy, but, uh, and, and eventually, it's the nature to decide. So uh, dark energy is the area where a lot of people saw that it should be zero and they were wrong, et cetera. So uh, maybe we shouldn't be too biased and explore in, uh, a possibility. Anyway, I want to consider this quintessence scenario. Okay, so even if you consider this quintessence scenario, there are already some problems. For example, okay, so as I said already, if this slope of the potential is very large, and of course it loads too much, and that's a problem. So the potential should be extremely flat. And that's already a challenge because, uh, okay, you can lighten some potential with a very flat, but there are all sorts of quantum corrections and it's no longer flat. So the flatness is spoiled. That's the same issue as the similar issue as the inflation, but here in a sense the situation is worse because the, the relevant energy scale is much, much smaller. So there can be many potential sources uh, for, uh, for spoiling the flatness. So that's certainly one of the reasons why quintessence scenario is difficult. Okay, so, but can, can we still try to proceed? Um, so one possibility is to uh, say that there is some underlying symmetry. So the, if you have low energy field series and want to explain something is small, and a good explanation usually is to consider some symmetry. And that's where this uh, quintessence uh, axiom comes in. So that's part of my title. Uh, namely, so let's consider the scenario where uh, there is some non abelian gauge field, FFT, so this is a topological term, and there's a set angle, dynamical set angle, uh, which, is the, uh, and which is promoted to dynamical field. So this action divided by decay constant. So F is known as a decay constant, which has dimensional mass. Okay, so suppose something like this happens, and then A doesn't basically doesn't couple to anything else, and if this is the case, Okay, and uh, why is good? Uh, that, that's because there is a shift symmetry, uh, perturbatively. The topological term doesn't do anything in the perturbation theory, so perturbatively there is a symmetry, but that's broken by non perturbative symmetry and giving rise to this potential uh, with the dynamical scale lambda. And uh, the, the, of course, the, there's a dimensional transmutation, so there is a non trivial scale, and lambda can be much, much smaller than Planck scale if the value of this alpha is, uh, uh, is uh, depending on the value of alpha, for example, can be uh, very small. So this is how you get uh, scale. So, uh, so you might expect that if there is any hope of explaining anything with the quintessence, this might be one of the most plausible scenarios because there is under symmetry reasons why there is such a small scale. Now, well, there, there can be multiple complaints. 
And uh, suddenly I'm not going to discuss all the components, but one of the components is that, okay, I said that there is some no abelian gauge field, and if you're a model builder, you're not, you're okay, uh, you're used to that, but uh, still, but it's like uh, cooking up something uh, which we don't know to explain one thing. It sounds bad, and also, okay, so there is a parameter alpha, and uh, I need to fine tune this value of this alpha to explain dark energy. So it sounds too much to, uh, to hope for. It's fine to do that, but it sounds unnatural. Is there a more minimal way of doing that? So that's the question. And it turns out that you don't actually need to introduce extra sector because uh, inside the standard mode, there is an electroweak SU2 case group. And that does exactly the right job. So what I mean is that, okay, so the value of alpha two, the coupling constant, at the z boson mass is like a one over 30, one over 29, and that doesn't reproduce the size of the dark energy. But if you do the RG learning all the way to the Planck scale, okay, let's assume here that there is no, any part, no, no particle charged on the SU2. It sounds unnatural, but I'm coming to that uh, uh, towards the uh, latter part of my talk. But let's first assume naively uh, do the RG learning all the way to the Planck scale. And then you get the value like 1 over 48. And then it actually has the, uh, almost the correct value. So if you just plug in this value 1 over 48, and you get like a 10 to minus 130, which is very close to the value of the dark energy, which is like a 10 to minus 120. Uh, so this is very close. And in fact, if you like, this is just a classical piece, but if you like to make it closer, you can have a one loop piece. And that, and that will become even closer to minus 120. Anyway, so this is the numer numerology, uh, but I think it's a curious one. And uh, so, uh, so that's the scenario of this electroweak quintessence action. So you do the quintessence action, but the action comes from the set angle for electroweak SU2. Yeah, if you open the QFT textbook, they talk a lot about the QCD action, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, the area about the electroweak uh, uh, action, partly because the associated energy scale is very small. And sometimes they even comment that, okay, the energy scale is so small, so it's irrelevant, et cetera. But I'm not saying that it, it's actually the uh, same order of magnitude as the size of dark energy. Is there any other parameters in our function? Uh, let's see. So if you assume that there are no, no, no particle, et cetera, there, there, is no, it, there is no parameter. But of course, you can change, for example, if you want to learn up to the reduced Planck scale or Planck scale, et cetera. Uh, but that's a logarithmic learning, so it doesn't change the whole, uh, too, order too, too much. much. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually, I didn't do anything fancy. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just, I just learned it, and it's uh, this part. So that's an interesting observation, I think, going back to the 90s or so. Well, there is a subtle question. Well, but first of all, theoretical questions. And, uh, and then if you look at the, in the literature, there are some, also some, sometimes some confusions about this. So one of the questions is that, okay, I know that, uh, isn't that the case, the electroweak set angle is unphysical? And what I mean by that is that electroweak SC2 is the chirality is, uh, okay, so maximally violated, maximally chiral. So, um, so this can be loaded the way uh, by anomalies of B plus L global symmetry. So you, there's anomalies, so isn't that you can load it away the set angle, so isn't that unphysical? And that's true, uh, except that, uh, except that um, uh, that's not true once you include the higher dimension operators. So in the standard model, you can write on dimension six operator QQQL, and that's, that breaks the B plus L symmetry, and then hence makes the set angle uh, dynamical. Uh, sorry, not, not dynamical, physical, no, non-trivial. And uh, the fact that there exists such operator is very natural from, uh, from low energy effective field theory viewpoint. And somewhat related with that, uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, feature in how, when you do the computations of the instant action. So in the usual QCD, when you do the instant on computations, okay, so there is a, this is a standard factor, and this low is the size module of the instant on. So the instant on module, if you, in the one instant on computation, the size of the vacuum energy goes like this. So, and the, and the size module integrates from zero to infinity. Now, if you take the more familiar series like a QCD, what happens is that, okay, so the coupling constant depends on this scale low, so you can do the one loop uh, uh, beta function to extract that factor, and then it turns out it has a positive factor low in total. So that's, uh, that, so that's the reason why there's a dominant contribution comes from low quantum infinity, so named very deep IR. 
And that's the famous IR problem of the QCD. And I have some papers discussing the connection of that to confinement and the resurgence, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, so that's the typical divergence comes from the UV. Ah, uh, sorry, IR. That's very different in the electro weak SU2. Well, first of all, the value of beta function coefficient changes, 7 to uh, uh, 90 over 6. But it's also the case that you need a higher dimensional operator. So this is related with what I said before. So without a higher dimensional operator, there is a B plus L symmetry, so the set angle is not, not physical, so there is no potential. In other words, when you do the one instant on computation, you have to kill the zero modes. And in order to kill the zero modes, you have to use this uh, higher dimensional operator. And uh, we sub it's a dimension six, so it's suppressed by one of a Planck scale, squared. And there are three generations, so you have to take three of them, giving rise to this factor. So precisely because of this factor, the, even the power of the row changes, and you get the negative power in the instant on computation in electroweak SU2. So uh, this divergence near the zero, uh, and, and the usual argument is that, okay, it diverges, but there is some unknown physics of the Planck scale which makes it finite. So that's where this uh, Planck scale comes in. In this analysis, I uh, declared uh, before that I just should evaluate this at the Planck scale, but that arises from some subtleties of the instant on calculus I explained. Anyway, uh, so this is the numerology, and uh, so you can try to push that further and then say, okay, so dark energy, you don't have to include any extra ingredient. You're just the electroweak SU2, and it generates the correct size of dark energy, and you might be happy that's what uh, that's the electroweak quintessence action scenario. And, and, and if you have low energy effective fuel series, that's uh, as far as uh, you cannot go too far there. But there's an extra constraint, which is the weak gravity conjecture, which is one of the swamp plant conjectures. So what is the weak gravity conjecture? So weak gravity conjecture comes in various different versions and, and uh, et cetera, and it's complicated history and et cetera. Uh, but in this talk, I'm very pedagogical, uh, well, let's say very practical. And uh, in practice, I just need this, this inequality. Okay, so what does it mean? So F is a decay constant, the parameter. But it just basically means that F is bounded by the Planck scale. Uh, it should be much smaller than Planck scale. A little bit more precise statement, F is bounded by the Planck scale divided by the size of the instant action. So if you prime in the value of the alpha two, it's like 100. So F is parametrically smaller than the Planck scale by two orders of magnitude. This is what is implied by the weak gravity conjecture. And that's promoted to a general principle, but you can also try to look at various concrete string theory realizations, and people know that it's hard to make a very, uh, the decay constant extremely large. <coughs> and why is this a problem? Uh, it's in tension with uh, what sh should be the case. Namely, okay, so, uh, okay, so this is the mass of that axiom. And the mass of the action is given by this formula. Mass is determined a second derivative. So each time you take a derivative, there is a one of factor one over f. And there was already this uh, dynamical scale. So this mass is given by this combination. And if you use the standard cosmological formulas, this is the size of this dark energy derivative is the current value of the Hubble. And this means that if the, uh, well, okay, so, uh, and, and, and then, so the, well, let's see. The observational constraint is for us. So this should be smaller than the current value of the Hapo. And this is because the Hapo, uh, in the, well, in the cosmological expansion, Hapo plays the role of the friction term. So uh, as long as the mass is uh, uh, comparable or larger uh, than the Planck, uh, the Hapo, uh, sorry, the, as long as the Hapo is large, uh, larger than the Planck scale, then uh, there is a friction term, it, it, it doesn't move. So it stays at the potential forever. But the Hubble is smaller, for example, zero, for example, there is no asteroid expansion, then of course it begins to roll. Uh, and, and you won't want the rolling to happen too dramatically. And that's why you need this condition, and that gives that the condition that decay constant is larger than the Planck scale. Anyway, that's what the, the phenomenological constraint, observational constraint, and that seems to be battery in tension with this weak gravity conjecture. So that's a fatal blow to this uh, uh, quintessence scenario. 
Oh, okay, so if you have a model builder, you try to look for various loopholes, and one of the loopholes people find is that, okay, maybe I should try to fine tune the initial condition to this top of this grid distance potential. Basically, the idea is that if you're very close to the top of the potential, then you might have loaded, started loading, but haven't loaded too much. And, and it's fine. And that's the hilltop top quintessence scenario. Except that it's actually very bad because if you try to see what kind of fine, how much fine tuning you needed at this top of the boundary conditions, then it turns out that the order of the uh, initial condition, fine tuning, is all the exponential. Exponential plunk divided by the decay constant, and there was an order 100 separation between these two scales, so you have an order of exponential 100 fine tuning you needed, which looks extremely bad. So this uh, option seems to be eliminated. Well, if you don't want to fine tune this amount. Now, uh, but I still don't give up, and uh, or people still didn't give up. So for example, this is the same slide as before, but if you try to compare with these things, the problem happens because of the size of this instant action. So then uh, maybe, uh, let's say, one day you might have come up with a great idea. Okay, this is the problem. Why don't you change the size of this instant action, alpha two? For example, alpha two is two pi. There is no such factor, and then you can satisfy both these constraints at f equals n prime. Well, can you do that? Well, okay, so for that, you need the value of alpha two to be changed at the prime scale. And uh, previously, I get this value of one over 48, such that the instant action is 100, but if you want to change it, okay, sure. Uh, I can change the RG learning by including heavy particles to uh, instant action uh, order 10, order one, et cetera, and then you have fine tuning is much better. So one day you might come up with this possibility. It's contrived, but nevertheless, you might think about that. It happens that it's actually very bad because once you try to change the value of the instant action, and then you change the whole starting point because you have this lambda, and I motivated the whole scenario by saying that, okay, it gives like to one over 48, and it generated the correct value of the dark energy. But I'm now saying that, okay, if you, you, you try to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, but I spoke in the whole story. So for this reason, it seems that we are uh, comp well, in a complete dead, dead end. And that's where, uh, let's see, so uh, we, we come to talk about the supersymmetric uh, extension of the model. And there are some interesting things happening, and that's going to be very crucial for saving the scenario. Okay, so let's first consider, let's start from scratch, and let's consider electric uh, action, but together with this MSS and minimal extension of the supersymmetric standard model, and I choose the Suzy breaking scale to be like a 10 to 10 uh, GB, and the uh, spider mass is to be like a TeV, for example. It can be 10 TeV, et cetera, there are some parameter regions. But let's say TeV for naturalness. And then let's consider the electroweak set angle again. And, uh, and we redo the whole analysis. And then uh, you have to change uh, many of the stories. Well, first of all, well, it's a well-known story, uh, minimal extension, supersymmetric extension of the supersymmetric standard model, that if you have a supersymmetric standard model, then there, there is dangerous dimension five proton, uh, dimension five operators, which is in tension with the constraints on proton decay. Well, there is even a dimension four operator, which is dangerous for flavor changing neutral current, but let's say you put a Z2, Z2 symmetry to forbid it. Then, and then there is a dimension five operator. So if this coefficient of this is one over prime, that's already in tension with experiment. That's a well-known story. And what people done is to, okay, maybe there is some other reason why the coefficient in front of here is small. And that goes by the name of the frogat nielsen symmetry. So there is some symmetry which is broken and uh, by the Babel some field, uh, which is smaller parametrically than the prime scale. And then that generates some powers of this parameter which I denoted epsilon. And, and okay, so it looks like a, a contrived scenario, and it, it is in a sense, but it also has a virtue that if you have this such a small parameter, it helps to explain uh, the, the quark and the, um, 
uh, lepton mixing matrix, like for example, neutrino mixing met PMS and S or CKM matrices, uh, those people have measured and then tried, there is some interesting hierarchy. The coefficients are not all, every, no, not all the coefficients all the one. So people try to explain the symmet uh, hierarchy and that, that is, can be explained by the stroga Pearson symmetry. So you're imposing this extra symmetry but you're explaining something else. Okay, but let's, uh, and, and this parameter epsilon is going to be important. And this parameter particular value like a 17 is chosen in such a way that it fits nicely with the structure of the CKM matrix. Okay, so this is so far, and uh, let's come back to electroweak uh, uh, axioms. Now, in a sense, uh, we might have a, seem to have a huge problem already here, because, because we have more matter, so that RG learning changes. So originally it was one over 48, but now we have extra matter, so it becomes one over 23. So it actually seems to be very bad already. However, uh, if you do the instanton computation, things are a little bit different, partly because there are some extra powers. Well, first of all, there is this uh, frogat nielsen symmetry uh, and the small breaking parameter, and there is some power of that coming to that. And, and also, uh, there, instead of having the fourth part of the prong scale, there is a cubic power of the Suzy breaking scale, which I took to be TV. So there are some interesting factors here coming here and there. So although the value alpha two is different, there is some extra suppression factor. And that, it, it turns out if you combine all the factors, for example, the value of epsilon was chosen to explain the quark mixing matrix, not to explain this, but somehow if you plug in these values, you get the correct order magnitude for the, uh, for the size for the dark energy. So after all, uh, in supersymmetric theory, you need to change the story uh, in, in multiple ways. And, uh, and, and many of the things I said before, for example, this, this certainly have, is, is a standard in, in uh, MSSM's uh, discussion, but if you include that, and uh, first of all, you get the correct size of the dark energy. Okay, now I'm coming back to the issue of the, uh, okay, that, that, well, of course, that is what you already did when we discussed non supersymmetric case, but uh, we, we now have to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, and what's going to happen? So the idea is still the same, so you can try to include the heavy matter, to change the value of RG, RG uh, learning of the alpha two, so that uh, the weak gravity con conjecture con constraint is, uh, so you, you try to make the value of alpha larger and larger so that there is less fine tuning. And that you can do by uh, including some heavy particles charged on the SU2 with the mass MX. And if it's only presentation R, there is some Dinky index coming to the one loop learning of, of this alpha. And in the non supersymmetric case, the problem was that, okay, it's fine to change the R journey, but it changes the scale of the in, in, dynamical scale of the instanton. However, the non trivial point, in fact, this is almost the only non trivial point, is that uh, once you increase heavy particles, we are in the supersymmetric theory. So it inevitably introduces the fermions, so there are extra zero modes in the instanton calculus. So you have to insert extra operators proportional to the mass of this operator. So you're going to get the suppression factor of mx, this mass of this heavy field divided by Planck scale to some power. And if you do this computation, you get this, uh, the same coefficient as before. So let me repeat, if you include the heavy particles that changes the RG learning, and it is easier to satisfy uh, the weak gravity conjecture constraint, for us, um, uh, so that changes the body of alpha, alpha, but somehow there is extra factor coming up. So what happened to the energy scales once you include this x and x bar? So this is the original expression, but I said already that you need to kill extra zero mode, so there is extra suppression factor. And in addition, this RG learning is also different because you now have ex extra heavy field. And it turns out that these two effects precisely cancel out. Uh, there should be some conceptual explanation for this, but it's, it's, it's certainly the case. And, um, and then that means that this size of this dark energy is actually the same, preserved, even if you add the heavy field to the story. And this is actually nice. Well, first of all, uh, you can make the body, you can change the R-channing, 
And uh, it's easier to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture constraint. Um, but uh, it's also the case that uh, the size of the dark energy, which is the whole starting point of our discussion, is robust under the inclusion of such supersymmetric multiples. So even if you have a supersymmetric multiple charge on the SC2 along the way, you might expect all RG learning changes, so this value of lambda might change, but uh, it's not. So the value of lambda is just as the same as before without any heavy matters. So we are not just solving one problem of uh, trying to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, but it turns out that uh, uh, the value of this uh, lambda is now much more robust against the inclusion of heavy particles. And, uh, and of course, it's, it might be, well, the, uh, you, you never know what's up there in higher energy sc scales, but um, it might be natural to imagine that there are some heavy fields charged on the SU2. And this point says that, uh, it's, uh, that, that's, that doesn't spoil our story. Uh, so, okay, so this is how, how it works. Uh, maybe I can skip this. And, uh, okay, so I can actually skip a lot of stuff. So, uh, so this is uh, how it works. Um, so that's, uh, uh, well, let me, I can already try to summarize. Um, so I explained the electroweak quintessence axion scenario. And as the name says, it says that there is electroweak AC2 axion, electro, that's electroweak axion, and electroweak axion can play the role of the quintessence axion. Uh, hence, explain the dark energy is loading. And the whole point is based on the observation that the size of the dark energy is roughly given by uh, this one instant on, uh, expression and determined by alpha 2. And uh, well, first of all, I explained the non supersymmetric case that is already extremely close to the observed value. Uh, and, uh, but I explained why there is some constraint from the weak gravity conjecture. And, uh, and so for that reason, that this big gravity conjecture, if you, if you believe it, that this favors this scenario. However, if you consider the um, supersymmetric extension of the model, uh, there are learning changes, but somehow you have a, also a different, you know, a different separation factors, and still you get the correct size of dark energy. So I think this is an interesting scenario, especially if you take that very seriously, the particular body of dark energy. Like, uh, 10 to minus 120. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. Uh, yes. 10 to the minus 130 and then 10 to the minus 120. Yes. Uh, the difference between the top and bottom is you have m plank to the, is that m plank a square there you have? Oh, sorry, this is the fourth power. Sorry, sorry first of all. Yeah, okay. that's right. First of all, this should be the fourth power. So what is the difference? Right, so the, well, one difference is, of course, the r, r, alpha is different. Okay. If you, you, yeah, that's right. Sorry, I, should, I probably should have written explicitly. But this alpha 2 is a learning for uh, non supersymmetric theory. But here, you, you consider supersymmetric extension of everything. So there are extra matter and charge on the SC2, so that changes the origin so, learning. So I guess I missed the beginning of the talk. Oh, no problem, yes. So uh, how do we know what alpha 2 is? Uh, I mean, I... Yeah, so well, for, for example, here in this scenario, uh, I assumed um, uh, that there are no well, okay, let's take the standard mode of particles that we know. And let's assume that there are no particles in the intermediate region between Planck scale and the Z boson mass, which is charged on the SU2. That's an extremely strong assumption, but if we assume that, then do the running all the way to the Planck scale, and then probably in the body, it's somehow getting a very close value. Now, in this supersymmetric version, I do this, well, let's see. First of all, uh, alpha 2 itself you can compute. Uh, by, uh, first of all, let's first, let's start by assuming that, again, similar thing. So MSSM, no particles charged, no supersymmetric multiples charged on the SC2, and do the RG learning. And, uh, and then there is a robot Nielsen symmetry suppression factor, there is R symmetry, et cetera, and then there is some extra factor coming in. Yeah, that's right. And then somehow this extra suppression factor cancels uh, the difference in the RG line. So, so I guess one question is that, so this is just one contribution to vacuum energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, what about other contributions? Yeah, now I, I, I don't have anything intelligent to say. In, in other words, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to say that uh, I'm not necessarily solving the cosmological constant problem. And this can be easily, very easily overshadowed by anything. In fact, almost anything <laughs> contribution. So, uh, so uh, and so, okay, so of course, in order for this scenario, to make this scenario into a real possibility, you have to need some mechanism to control everything else, to any other contribution to dark energy. 
Oh, sorry, the, the vacuum energy and say that maybe sum up to zero or something like that. And uh, I don't necessarily have anything intelligent to say, but my approach today is that, okay, so uh, what, let's see. So let's try to take the input uh, from observation seriously, this particular value, like 120. Not just, a, well, people often formulate, okay, this is a small number you have to explain, et cetera, but not just a small one, not, not to 10 to one minus 50 or not, like 80 or so, but it's just this particular number. And, and since we, we know, there are very few things we know about the dark energy, so maybe the fact that this particular number might be telling you something. And of course, the anthropic consideration is one, one direction to that direction, but could there be other explanation of this number? And, and I think there are very few scenarios where this particular number is explained in some, somewhat more, something more fundamental. And the f something fundamental in this case is just a standard mode. Yes? The M, the little M, Susie, what yes. is that again? Yeah, it's a 1TEB, for example. So that's a ma mass of the uh, supersymmetric particles. Like, uh, okay, so yeah. Put it at yeah, that's right. So of course it's a parameter, so you can try to change it, for example. And uh, well, you, here I have in mind uh, motivating that through naturalness, for example. And uh, so, but, but of course as a scenario, so in, in a sense there is an extra parameter here which helps, but in a sense that, in a sense, it's not as rigid as before, in a sense. So you can try to, okay, maybe some people don't care about naturalness these days, and let's take a PEB, for example, like a 10 to 3 TEB, for example. Some people discuss PEB supersymmetry, for example. And then this is larger, and then actually you don't need that much of a forgot nuisance operation. So you actually don't need this operation. And then this thing becomes a large margin, much larger number. And, and interesting, if you, you can, then the, the size of this is becomes, uh, um, the mass, mass of, this, uh, of this thing becomes, um, becomes much larger and cross becomes like a minus 10 to 22 or so, so uh, which is uh, cross to the mass of the dark energy, which be, sorry, dark matter, which we don't know as a fuzzy dark matter, for example. So, okay, if you like, you can try to play around with this possibility, but I'm not really pushing that because uh, it's just one playing around with the parameter. So, but uh, at least the point we hear is that uh, uh, it's, uh, if you take some for naturalness reasons or other reasons, if you take to be TV, it seems to be the right order magnitude. Well, of course, there, there can be, I, mean, there, I didn't include a fact of pi, et cetera, or there are also uh, are powers of alpha coming from one loop, et cetera. So if you want, if you want to be precise, then you can, be, you can try to do the game of uh, playing around with parameters, et cetera. And uh, uh, so there is definitely room, but uh, at least, uh, uh, I mean, we, originally we were talking about uh, this is prank, et cetera. So we try to have, at least have a light order magnitude, like, uh, and that's the uh, that's how how, how I view it here. And and the nice so it's, it's, it's but nice thing about the supersymmetric case is that here I had to assume that there is no particle charge on the S2, but you don't necessarily need this assumption for this argument. So there are some virtues here, and uh, in addition to satisfying uh, uh, weak gravity conjecture. Yeah, and uh, so this is the, uh, and, and then uh, basically I said uh, what is written here, uh, but it's a very simple scenario to explain this uh, particular size of dark energy. And I took into account, uh, why I, talk, uh, I spent 10 minutes also explaining swamp run conjecture, but in this talk particular, I just used only the weak gravity conjecture. Well, in, um, I have a little bit, a couple slides about other conjectures, et cetera, but uh, so far minimally I only need this conjecture, but that was already powerful. And, uh, okay, so this uh, I said already, and then, uh, well, okay, once you have- Can you elaborate what that is by heat operation or fine-tuning? Oh, that's right, yeah, sorry, yeah, that's right. So uh, I was talking about that before, okay, but okay. So let's talk about uh, uh, non supersymmetric case, right? Just the usual heat top, uh, uh, sorry, usual uh, quit instance action, and just declare that it's an electro weak, for example. And, and then, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, uh, there is a, uh, the mass uh, tends to be uh, sorry, let's see, maybe it's faster to go to this side. So, uh, yeah, so we want this condition that mass is not too large. Okay. Yeah, and, and that says that the decay constant is frank or larger. Uh, but the weak gravity conjecture says that decay constant should be smaller, for example. Okay. And uh, so, well, but of course this assumes that the generic point in the cosine. So you might think, okay, if you fine tune to the very, very top of the, potential of the quintessence potential, then of course this is not true. I mean, it's loading, but hasn't started loading yet, so. Uh, then, I mean, you eventually fall down. So. That's right, that's right. So you have to fine tune extremely, basically because once it starts loading, it accelerates, so. Uh, so, uh, okay, it's fine to fine tune the initial conditions, and that's what people propose, but it turns out fine tune is extremely bad, uh, like exponential of 100 or something like that. Yeah, 
So that's, uh, that's the problem with the Hilton quintessence. Of course, you can maybe somehow say that, okay, I don't know, but you can try to argue for that, but uh, it's, it doesn't sound too appealing. I mean, at some point, people are sh may hope that maybe, okay, there is a 1% one, 1 fine tuning to fine tune the top of the hill, and it's okay. And then maybe you can live with that, but it's an insane, insane fine tuning you have, you have to do. And uh, so that was the problem. And that problem arises because of the hierarchy between this uh, uh, decay constant and the Planck scale, which in turn comes from the weak, uh, weak gravity conjecture. Yeah, so that was how, how I tried to motivate the uh, extension to supersymmetry, where it's easier to satisfy that constraint. Yeah, so, and, and then, uh, okay, so I talked about the scenario, and uh, it's probably I interesting to think about uh, implications. And uh, yeah, I don't know, but uh, for example, certainly, well, it's a quintessence scenario, so it's loading, so the value of the dark energy changes, so, and the usual state equation, equation state parameter, W, for example, W changes, and there's a parameter space to play around, and I'm not good at doing the Bayesian analysis and things like that. So I just uh, did uh, one, one particular, I forgot this parameter, maybe decay constant prank, and then you, you start with the middle of the potential or something like that, and, and then you have this thing. So this is the scale factor, so it, it's right now, and this is before. So early times it's very close to W equals minus one, like a cosmological constant. But then, well, it's natural because it's at some pop, pop the potential and there is a hub of friction, so it stays there. It effectively behaves like a constant, but then it begins to deviate. And uh, well, in this particular case, it doesn't deviate too much even now. So probably it's very difficult to detect this case. Uh, but I haven't exhausted all the param I mean, parameter searches, et cetera. And even without this electric quintessence, uh, I mean, people did, talk, did do this parameter search already. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, but, uh, so it depends on, especially on the initial conditions. And uh, anyway, so there maybe if you, in some cases, in some lucky cases, we might be able to uh, exclude this possibility already in some future measurement of W, like uh, coming from the observation, like Euclid, W first, ABSSD, et cetera. And, uh, and also, well, once you have these actions like things, and then there, uh, there can be uh, like a Faraday rotation, it couples to E times V in a sense. Well, this couples to electric case too, but you might imagine that after uh, electric breaking, it couples to photon, and uh, I haven't thought too much about it, but, but then there, there might be a rotation. And, uh, and people certainly talked about this in the context of QCD action, et cetera. So, but it, it's just the same thing, but it's energy scale is different, maybe there can be some constraints from the birefringence. And, and finally, uh, okay, so here I talked about electric action. Surprisingly, there are very few literature on that compared with the QCD action where there are literally thousands of papers on that. And uh, so, and, and at least morally speaking, if you have a QCD action, why not the uh, action for the electric SC2? Uh, regardless of whether it's, a, uh, uh, whether it's a, a dark matter or not, sorry, dark, dark energy or not. And uh, so it's interesting to uh, think more seriously about the electric action in general. Uh, okay, so that's basically it. And so uh, today I discussed a particular scenario with quick quintessence action, um, and uh, based on the uh, body of the dark energy, and uh, mostly from low energy fixed field theory argument from the axions, but uh, and, uh, and uh, the weak gravity conjecture in the form of the swamp plant conjectures. So I talked about this. Uh, well, okay, whether you buy this particular scenario itself uh, is, is a matter of question, but I talked about this scenario as just a case study where. Uh, some, there are some interesting constraints coming from swamp plant conjectures, um, and, and that eliminates some possibilities and, and, uh, and, and which motivates further uh, model, model building uh, so that in order to satisfy all the constraints. And for me, it's, I mean, it was, well, of course, there are little bit of observational constraints, and, uh, and most of the low energy physics friends I know don't care about the swamp plant conjectures, but in a sense, uh, it's natural to take into account uh, if uh, all the ingredients are available, including the swamp plant conjectures. And, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's what I'm doing now. And um, so this is an example where interesting constraints from the swamp plant conjectures, but as I said before, uh, there are some cases where uh, these observational constraints uh, does say something about the precise uh, uh, version of the swamp plant conjecture as well. So I think it's an interesting area where there is an interaction between uh, string series and uh, uh, cosmologies and, uh, and uh, particle physicists. Thank you. Uh, 
Sana 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 s